well, my own experience of it was that I had to surrender uh, to him. Now, having surrendered to God and having put my trust in Jesus, I wanted to be good. <laughs> I wanted to be good. I wanted to please him. I wanted to live a good life. And, and I thought that would be easy. I thought if I wanted it, that it would be there to be had. And then I found that every day I was, I was slipping up. I was doing wrong things. I was having wrong thoughts. I was, and now 40, what is it? More than 40 years later, <laughs> um, I'm still struggling with that. The, the, the issue of human of the sin of the human heart, something which the Bible uh, puts a great emphasis on. Um, we, we, we have a bad heart. Um, and, uh, and God, to quote the Bible, is of two pure eyes than to behold iniquity. That there is this great problem here between the holiness of God, the holy God on the one side, and and a sinful uh, creature, a, a worm, as you say, on the other hand. And the Bible is asking this question over and over again. How can a sinful man... Well, of course, in the Old Testament, there was a whole sacrificial system to deal with this in a ritual way. But again, the Bible is asking from beginning to end, how will it be dealt with in a real way? And the ultimate answer that uh, is given to that in the Bible is that it's, it's, it can be dealt with and it can only be dealt with by a saviour by God himself uh, becoming a human being, uh, taking our, coming to our side, representing us, and, uh, and giving himself from our side, from a human side, uh, as a sacrifice for sin, so that the guilt that we carry, the punishment that we deserve, uh, is transferred to him and we can be of the Bible's word for this is justified we can be justified and we can go free and 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 in that freedom we 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 discover relationship with God we discover that relationship with God which Abraham enjoyed which Moses had and uh, which of course perfectly uh, as as a human being Jesus Jesus had and invites us you know when you pray he says pray our father he addressed God always as his, as his father and he invites us into that same kind of relationship. I think I wouldn't, um, it seems like a huge jump, but I think uh, perhaps I'll just end with one point. I'm being a little bit random here in responding to some of the things that you were saying. Um, but, um, but if we're talking about the things that... Uh, that um, Christians, um, what was the term again? What? How, how we, how we, what was the, what was the subject we started with? Distrust. 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 Yeah, uh, an issue in which, uh, you know, we, we see, we see Muslims today. Um, on the one hand, we see all this jihad going on, um, which scares the pants off us. I've got to say. <laughs> we see that on the one hand. On the other hand, we see, uh, of course, many Muslims distancing themselves from that. Um, but we wonder how far we don't, we don't know. We're just confused. <laughs> 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 mm? Distrust. <laughs> Distrust. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and uh, then we, we see Muslims uh, putting themselves forward as, well, as you put it, um, not, not having any kind of imperialistic, uh, and yet we see Islam for its first almost thousand years. We see Islam uh, essentially uh, colonizing, um, um, militarily uh, overcoming uh, the, the, the whole Eastern Christian world up, in, up as far as uh, the uh, Adriatic, the Aegean, sorry, and the whole of North Africa. And, and we still see the whole of North Africa basically ruled by Muslim uh, people with the native peoples uh, in some kind of um, second-class uh, 
sort of citizenship. So uh, it's it's a it's a it's a sort of a <laughs> it's a sort of propaganda thing, I suppose. We we, we we see you accusing of some us of something, which we feel that uh, if if we're guilty, you're equally guilty. <laughs> And uh, we, we, have, we have kind of renounced uh, that kind of imperialism and colonialism. And I say, we, this is crazy because it's not really Christians, is it? It's this secular thing that we both, it's these secular governments who may have a kind of Christian origin, but they're not Christian anymore. But anyway, looking at it at a very, very clumsy level, you see all these powers kind of having moved out of Africa, uh, given Africa back to the Africans. But do you see anything like that? In North Africa, do you see anything like that in a land which is ruled by Muslims? No, still uh, hanging on very tight. So, if you talk about distrust, there's an issue there, there's a big issue there, there's a big political issue there that we need to uh, come to some kind of understanding on. Well, I don't want to do all the talking, I think there are other people who probably yeah. want to <laughs> say some more as well. But thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. Thanks so for. Um, Thanks for the uh, initiative that you've taken to, uh, to get this sort of dialogue going. And uh, talking about dialogue, just reminds me, one name there you should scrub out of your list, and that's Hans Kung. I love um, Hans Kung. <laughs> I, I heard Hans Kung. Have you uh, met him? I heard him giving a lecture some years ago, and he was actually talking about, because uh, Hans Kung, um, interesting man, was a Roman Catholic, but. Roman Catholic the Pope didn't like him anyway, so they kicked him out. <laughs> and uh, he was, they, uh, he was they know him affectionately in Tübingen as the Burgermeister, of, <laughs> the, the, the mayor of Tübingen, they call him, that's his nickname. Um, the, uh, the people there were so uh, committed to him that they set up a, a chair of, what's it called, ecumenical theology, I think, at the University of Tübingen. So he, well, at least when I was in Tübingen, he was, uh, every year he would, uh, for his students, he would uh, he would have a different religion, and so it would be the study of Islam this year. And uh, and the, the way they would study it is not looking at books. They would he would take the students and he would go and they would go to an Islamic country and dialogue like we're doing here. But I remember him talking about a trip which he did to to uh, Tehran, I think, uh, during the the time of the Ayatollah Khomeini, and. Uh, he was welcomed, and uh, he said, um, he said all the mullahs were there. The Ayatollah was not there. He was the only one who wasn't there. Um, but his daughter was there. <laughs> the Ayatollah's daughter. <laughs> yes, and uh, the women apparently were behind a curtain. They were not in the main meeting, but they were there and listening. And uh, the point that he was making in the lecture was, he said, I, they wanted me to explain the doctrine of the Trinity. So he said a lot of people see, uh, see uh, sort of inter-religious dialogue and that sort of thing as, as, as an attempt at somehow breaking down all the differences and getting to some kind of common uh, thing. He said, he, said, I didn't, I, he said, I've never seen it that way. I think the best path to coexistence and to mutual respect is if I don't try to... Uh, to make a Muslim believe anything different than he believes, but I try to understand what he believes, respect what he believes, uh, nor did the Muslim then want the Christian to sort of shift his ground to accommodate, so it's in that respect. So he said, I simply expounded the doctrine of the Trinity, three persons, one God, Jesus uh, is God become a human being, the Spirit of God is God. Uh, in spirit, and yet somehow there is fellowship within the person of God. Uh, within anyway, uh, he he explained all that, and uh, he said he received only warmth. I mean, this was at a time politically and historically. I mean, this was tension was huge at this particular time. Um, he said later on, the Ayatollah's daughter came and spoke to him and thanked him very much for what he'd said and promised that she would relate it all to the Ayatollah. <laughs> so, so I don't think Hans Kung is somebody who, uh, although in some ways we would see him as, uh, you know, as going down that secular liberal road to a degree, yet not perhaps so far. Uh, he certainly uh, maintains, I think, a conviction that Jesus is uh, God. 
the Word of God become flesh. But thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity for speaking. Just to comment, uh, well, lots of doctors standing. Um, uh, perhaps maybe Dr. Prophet, I thought just to kind of um, expand the discussion, you know, he did speak about the fact that, and I have this problem all the time, that certain liberal scholars will be rejected by certain denominations, other denominations would accept the workings of the conservatives. Now, this is the Church of England in South Africa. I think it's not actually the same as the, the Anglican Church, if I'm not mistaken, it's but a it's, it's a complete separate. I think in, in 84, in fact, there was, uh, you know, a discussion by, um, you know, you had people like Reverend Don Hubert and so on, but there was a kind of a survey conducted by Anglican bishops, and that was subsequently related. Most of them were conservatives. They were from the conservative fringe uh, back then, and, and what had happened was that they passed a kind of a ruling whereby they stated that even mainstream Christians are not obliged to believe that Jesus Christ himself is in any sense divine, according to survey. In fact, I think it was about 31 of 39 uh, Anglican bishops stated that many of the descriptions that you find and the kind of deity was not part and parcel of the, uh, should be, you know, it was not obligatory to believe that. And what I was trying to suggest when I presented this was that if that's the case, then if, if that is not, um, something which is part and parcel of an obligation of the faith, which the Anglican bishops, the majority, would say, for example, reject his deity, and if that's accepted by the mainstream, then the point of divergence between both Islam and Christianity would, to a certain extent, fall when we be made right. close and quite considerably. You're quite right, it would. And, uh, in fact, there'd be almost nothing left um, between us. I, I, I have to make a confession, I'm an Anglican priest <laughs> from the Anglican Church in Australia. And I'm help here helping the Church of England South Africa. And the Church of England South Africa is an Anglican uh, denomination, um, historically. Um, it's, um, uh, it's, as you say, a conservative um, Anglican denomination. I, I'd like to see the, I'd like to see the documentation on what you're saying. I, I, I suspect what you're saying is, well, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, ring quite true with me. Uh, Don Cupid, you mentioned, I, I know him well. <laughs> I was a student at Emmanuel College in Cambridge and Don Cupid was the chaplain. And uh, it, was a, it was a particular occasion where Don Cupid was going around the, the, the college telling everybody that uh, David II had actually agreed with him on something. <laughs> that didn't happen very often. <laughs> we were pretty much like this. Now, Don Cupid was really making up his own religion. And uh, he was gathering together a lot of... Uh, he even gave it a name. He called it critical faith. But it was basically... It was, it was, it was religious secularism. And uh, that's... Uh, that book... Um, yeah, you see... <coughs> One, our Bible, uh, our Bible, uh, very heart and sort of centre of our Bible is that uh, we we are saved. Uh, we saved by a man, but no man could possibly save himself, let alone save the world. The only way that God could save the world was to Himself become a man, and as a man do what only a man could do, which was to make amends for what human beings have done for God. Um, and that is enshrined in all of our creeds. Um, and, uh, and, and in all of our documents, so that... <laughs> I'll tell you a little story. When, when, again, when I was there studying in Cambridge, I, I heard that the Muslims in Egypt were... Uh, were um, really making great gains within the Christian community by quoting uh, liberal so-called Christian scholars. They're saying, look, even your own scholars agree with this now, exactly what you're saying here. I, I got very upset when I heard that. And uh, my professor, um, I, I said to him, you know, this, these... I wasn't angry with the Muslims, I was angry with, the, with these liberal so-called Christian scholars. I said, you know, these guys are going to have a lot to answer for on the Day of Judgment. And I was really getting a bit sort of over the top. And, and, uh, <laughs> and his comment was, he says, ah, but wait till Islam has its own enlightenment. 
That was his goal. Wait till Islam has its own liberal scholars to contend with. We've been fighting this, as I say, for more than 200 years. Uh, I think you're lucky. <laughs> you haven't had a movement like that, at least as far as I know, that has, from within the mosque, challenged every, uh, every little aspect of uh, Islam and then taken huge numbers of Muslims with them. But, but it'll come. But just, just on that point about from, from the Islamic perspective, I mean, we, we have our conservatives. We also have our liberal Muslim scholars. I mean, you've got, I've got a list. In fact, the write-up that I did here was a liberal Muslim scholar. But I think the, the distinction here is that between us is that our liberal scholars get a lot of flack from the conservatives, from the ruling orthodoxy. Mm. But the point is, even in the, in the, in the kind of documented investigation on, on scripture for that matter, no liberal scholar basically has come to the conclusion where the authenticity of the Quran was basically questioned. Of course, they, 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 they study the manuscripts, they look at the discoveries at Sana'a in Yemen in 1973 and so on, and they do internal critique on the actual book itself, but none of them have come to the conclusion that, look, the book is not authentic or something along that line. Now, well, why I was raising this, because I was quite concerned, certainly, uh, you know, it was not just uh, Don Cupid, you had uh, Jennings himself, and I think the present Archbishop, Roman Williams, is also uh, quite a liberal. I mean, uh, and, and, and where you had a mainstream body like the Anglican bishops, uh, this was a Daily News article, I think, in 84, uh, and, and of course over the years, where there all was this kind of consensus. So it basically gives the indication that it's not just something amongst the liberal school. But because from what I see, and I, I might be incorrect, and perhaps uh, Dr. Prophet would correct me here, is that most of these schools, like you look at the, even the Harvard Divinity School or Cambridge or Oxford, but most of, most of the main universities employ the works, for example, of Hans Kung or Richard Eliot Friedman. I mean, even at uh, Natal University, we had a kind of a conservative the a department of theology, but the works of Hans Kung are prescribed as recommended textbooks. You have the works of Richard Eliot Friedman, you have the other works of Albert Schweitzer, and so on. Um, it's just the private colleges that would perhaps go to the kind of reformist or well, conservative no, I think, background. I think, um, um, come at this. Well, simply to say that, let's talk about George Whitfield College where I teach myself, which is a training institution for the Church of England, South Africa, but I might say uh, we are drawing students from Anglican, uh, Anglican churches throughout Africa and also from England and, uh, and uh, from some South America and some other places as well. So. Although we are a bit on the fringe in terms of world Anglicanism, in terms of training, we, we're drawing. I think but we better just cl some of our friends want to go, and I don't want to just be rude. So okay, just let me finish this. Just, just to say that we we expose our students yeah. to all of that liberal stuff. Schweitzer, yep, the works. They have to read it. They have to see. They have to see what is being said against Christianity. And they have to find their way through all that. So, yeah, so we're familiar with all the kind of stuff. But, um, yes, yeah, sorry. I just want to know if you hunt crocodiles. Hunt crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm not going to that thing. Uh, so, sometimes, sorry. since I've, I've often thought, since I've been living in Cape Town, that I should carry a big knife. Professor <laughs> <laughs> Seekham, I just want to say that. Uh, if you remember, I, I, well, I remember, I watched a documentary where I saw Donald Rumsfeld in uh, Afghanistan, and he says, uh, go out for your religion and fight. And uh, it was a very romanticized word in Time magazine, how the Mujahideen fought the Russians. Mm -hmm. And the word Mujahideen was wonderful because they're fighting the non-believers, Russians. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm going to tell you, who, it never scared the pants that they were called Mujahid Jihad. And I think actually the word jihad came and was this because those mujahideen who were fighting the so-called holy war against the Russians, mm. and I saw it in Time magazine and they were heroes mm. at the time. So mm. the word jihad didn't scare the pants of anyone at the time, sir. Mm. Because I saw Donald Trump, uh, uh, he was deputy, yeah. deputy, deputy, deputy uh, 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 minister of some defense at that time. And there's a movie about it now coming yeah, out. But I think also but on that point, 
uh, the other issue is uh, I haven't seen all the Australians who are non-Aborigines moving out of Australia as yet to go back where they came from. Some. <laughs> because uh, 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 in Indonesia, there's no other race group except Indonesians who are Muslims. Uh, I, I haven't seen uh, uh, Americans leaving uh, uh, North America and going back to where they came from and leaving it to the indigenous. Uh, uh, in 